Righty ho! Hi everyone! Welcome again to Author Story. I'm Alexander Lim, your host, and for this episode, I'm interviewing Bill Shutt, author of the book Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History. And for those of you following along who are interested, you can go over now to the Amazon link in the description below the video and check out or get a copy of Bill's book. So Bill, welcome to Author Story. Thanks for being our guest. Well, thanks for having me, Alex. Cool. So, Bill, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself in the book? What's your author's story? My author's story? Well, yeah. I grew up in New York. I've always had a love uh, for animals, movies, the mm. macabre. Okay. When I, uh, when I was a kid, I was always rolling over stones and looking under logs. When I, went to, when I wound up going to school, I studied biology. Okay. I did a PhD at Cornell. All right. Looking at vampire bats. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and so I'm currently, well, I took a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History, and I've, mm. I've been a college professor since then mm. uh, as well. And, uh, and I've just been lucky enough to be able to expand my research into, uh, into books for general readership, hmm. both nonfiction and fiction. All right, cool. So I take it you're very interested in biology and the animals and all that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, the stranger the better, usually. Uh, okay. when, when people hear that I've, I've written books about vampires and cannibals, nobody's really very surprised. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. So if I may ask, uh, what's the strangest animal you've ever studied? Oh, let's see. Well, I studied all three species of vampire bats, and I, mm. I, that, that's really how I cut my teeth as a, uh, uh, as a researcher, mm. first as a graduate student and then as a, a postdoc and uh and then as a, um, you know, uh, as a college professor and researcher at the Museum of Natural History. Um, right. And and they're fascinating animals. You know, there are probably 1,200 species of bats in the world, and only three of them feed on blood. Right. And so there were a lot of neat aspects to the biology that I was able to study. Mm, nice. Cool. Okay. Got that. So uh, so I, I take it then you're... you're uh, you've dealt with a wide variety of animals, uh, animal species then. <laughs> yeah, I was the kid that had the monkey when I was little. Um, oh, okay. You know, I had just about every type of pet that you can imagine. All right. Okay, cool. All right. So next, Bill, the book. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about it and what it's all about? Yeah, Cannibalism is really a, a, a follow-up to a, a book that I, that I wrote several years ago called Dark Banquet, Blood mm. and the Curious Lives of, of, of Blood-Feeding Creatures. And that was, uh, in a sense, a way to demystify the natural history of creatures that fed on blood. Mm -hmm. um, there were sensationalized books out there and there were academic books, but there was nothing really in the middle. And that and cannibalism seemed like a, a great follow-up to that. Here is a, a, a topic that uh, that that people, you know, when, when you think about it, there's a lot of sensational material out there. But yep. uh, I was surprised at some aspects of it, like, you know, how widespread it was in the animal kingdom, mm -hmm. how many functions it actually had besides mm. the obvious ones of not enough food or overcrowding. Right. Uh, and then to be able to, to take that zoological viewpoint and, and bring it to uh, the study of human cannibalism. Mm. Uh, and there were some surprises there as well. I mean, when you think of human cannibalism, you think of, uh, you know, uh, the Donner Party or the strandings of the uh, rugby team in, 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 uh, in the Andes. Right. But... There's ritual cannibalism and medicinal cannibalism, and uh, you know there's uh, learned cannibalism in, in many different types of it in mm -hmm. cultures that that weren't necessarily brought up thinking that it was uh, this this horror or were the worst taboo that you could uh, that, that that you could undertake. All right. Okay. Cool. So, if I may ask, what inspired you to write this book? Was there any like you met, you did mention that it's like a follow-on to another previous book, but. But was there like an, you know, an aha moment that made you realize, you know, this thing should be out in the world out there? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think that it was, it really, you know, I was looking for a book to follow up a book on vampirism. And cannibalism just seemed to fit that, you know, fit perfectly as something okay. that uh, a lot of people are grossed out by. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so my approach to this was was not highly sensationalized and it was not highly academic mm. so i wanted to be entertaining and mm. and humorous when i could be because you just you know when you're talking about human tragedy you, you there's just no place for that right. but there are other places where you can be entertaining and humorous and i tried to 
to, to demystify this behavior right. uh, across the animal kingdom and then take that angle um, in, in an examination of the behavior in humans. Right, okay. So let's let's talk a little on the topic. I mean, as you mentioned before, cannibalism is kind of taboo. It's kind of an icky subject in modern day society. Mm. But um, with regards to the natural world, I mean, how, like how widespread is cannibalism among animals? Uh, it's incredibly widespread. I think mm -hmm. it's probably found in every major animal group. Okay. Um, and, and, and certainly more prevalent in, in some groups, uh, like, the in, like the invertebrates, insects, for example. Okay. Very widespread. And then when you get to uh, animals with backbones, uh, fish that lay eggs, it, it probably is uh, it, it's the rule, I would think. Um, oh. and, and, and more than likely, uh, if fish lay eggs, then, then at some point they, they cannibalize them. Oh, okay. All right. So it's it's uh, some... all right. So it's really like it's not it's really like commonplace then. Absolutely commonplace. Um, and and as I said though, it's very different. And you know the predominance of cannibalism varies among groups. So mm -hmm. for example, you're not going to find it as much in mammals, although mm -hmm. you do, as you would say find it in uh, in fish or mm -hmm. even amphibians. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly among the invertebrates, animals like snails and uh, um, and and um, you know and the like. Oh, okay, all right. So snails, eat, snails are cannibals. Okay, that that kind of puts them in a different light for me. <laughs> yeah, um, the, I was I was really surprised at how widespread it was. That was that was a you know that was a, a shock going into this. The, for a long time, the the scientific community the. Uh, you know, the, the party line was something along uh, that cannibalism is found in certain groups like black widow spiders or right. crane mantises. And, and when you found it elsewhere, it probably had to do with captive conditions, you know, sticking these things in a cage or a tank right. or, uh, or lack of alternative food. Mm. And in reality, the, the functions of cannibalism span uh, reproduction to, uh, to parental care. Uh, to to a lifeboat strategy when 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 uh, you know as, a, as sort of a hedge against environmental change mm. and and these you know these instances were just some of them were incredibly neat and mm. uh, and I just thought that it would be uh, kind of fun to put them into a context that was relatively free of jargon and in a way that that people could be entertained by r rather than uh, smashing them over the head with, right. with either stational aspect or or something that was too scientific for most folks. All right. Cool. Okay. True. Got that. So, Bill, other than the obvious situation, you know, like where food is scarce or overcrowding and stuff like that, what evolutionary or survival purposes cannibalism serve? I mean, consuming your own kind, it's reducing the number of the species. Yeah. Well, it, it actually reduces the number of. Look, if you eat your uh, if if you eat your kin. You, you're you're reducing the number of those of your genes in in, yeah. in that population so that's a negative you know and the fact that you that there that there are diseases that pathogens that have evolved to overcome your uh, your immune defenses mm -hmm. if you're eating your own kind then you're going to be exposed to these pathogens right. but that can be that can be outweighed in many in many instances for example you know if you are laying a million eggs if you're a codfish okay. then you don't really recognize as those eggs as uh, you know that's my uh, that's my son Sammy and that's uh, Jane over there you <laughs> this is like you know you you approach them like like we would approach a, a handful of raisins this mm -hmm. is a, uh, a, a a harm a harmless readily accessible extremely nutritious food source and there's really no thought about uh, uh, about consuming kin mm -hmm. uh, on the you know uh, related to that um, it's a form of, of parental care in many species that lay, for example, eggs that are never going to hatch. They're mm. called trophic eggs, and these are eggs that are provided like little kids' meals to the to the hatchlings that, that you know that that uh, um, that, that show up. Um, and in some instances, the, the females will 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 give parts of their body. There are amphibians that when they're when they're their their larva hatch, they peel mm. her skin like a grape. Mm -hmm. And that skin is then replaced, uh, and so it's a it's a, a form of parental care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so throughout the animal kingdom, there are all of these interesting functions. So yeah, a lion goes, uh, a lion takes over a, a a pride, 
and there is a female with uh, uh, with with a young cub from a, another male, mm -hmm. and he eats that cub, kills it, and eats it, so that she comes into heat quicker. Otherwise, she's mm. not she's not going to be accessible uh, to to produce his young. So right. he kills that uh, the, the, that cub. This happens in the big cats quite right. often. So I just found instances like that that really had very little or nothing to do with what we commonly believe are the, are the reasons that cannibalism occurs, and that's, you know, you ran out of food, it's the Donner Party. Right, right, right. Okay, so so this this, this covers then more like reproduction and, in the long run, the the, uh, the carrying on of the species, because like, there's already available food, uh, the young offspring that survive will have a better chance of reaching adulthood, uh, and passing on genes, like in the case of lions, that sort of thing then. Yeah, I mean, passing on your genes, and uh, you know, there are there are other reasons as well. So, um, and and this was just, you know, there were researchers who were doing this work, but nobody really pulled it together until the 1980s. And then the works that came out were were really academic. Mm -hmm. So that no, you know, the people who were reading these were 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 specialists, right. uh, reading this material. Right. So, um, you know, it wasn't until I, I I sort of fell on this topic that. You know, I came across it and it looked out there, and I said, "Well, there's really nothing that covers the entire expanse of the you know the, the totality of the animal kingdom, right. plus to take the zoologist's view of uh, of human cannibalism." Right. And so I got really lucky and uh, and just jumped in. All right, cool. So if I may ask, Bill, what is the I, now? But cannibalism is a little strange to us humans. But um, what is the weirdest uh, at thing or uh, animal that does cannibalism that you came across? Oh well, well, I already mentioned the the um, the uh, Sicilians, that, and that's I, I've always got to tell people that that name starts with a C because of my Italian relatives would get upset. Right, um, right. <laughs> little like little amphibians that you know the, the, some of them some of them hatch from eggs and others are born live, and, right. and both of them exhibit this kind of neat parental care cannibalism. Mm. The ones that hatch from eggs peel their mother's skin. The mm. ones that are born live. Will will actually consume the lining of their mother's oviduct while they are still in their mother's. Oh, uh, okay. that yeah, you know, I thought that was incredibly neat. Plus, the, wow. you know, the the sand tiger shark, uh, mm -hmm. that is a fascinating creature as well. Where you have uh, eggs that that this is an animal that does not lay eggs. That the, the the eggs develop inside the the female. Oh, okay. So, and they in a and shark. The eggs, yeah, and the eggs are produced at different stages. You know, okay. so they're, they're laid at different times. Uh -huh. And and the one the the two that hatch first, and there's one on the right um, oviduct and one on the left side. Right. Uh, the two that hatch first wind up eating all of the eggs that are in there that that aren't well developed yet. And then the ones that wind up hatching, they'll eat their siblings, so oh, okay. that only two of them hatch. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me, only two of them are are uh, are born. Uh, right. You know. Finally, well, they actually they actually do hatch, but they're inside their mothers. It's not they they are eggs. It's not like you've got a uterus or anything in there. Right. Um, so now you've got these two individuals that are that are finally born, and they are they've already, they're already trained hunters because they've been hunting in the womb, mm. or or the uh, shark equivalent to the womb. Right. Okay. And and do these guys, you know, are they are the two of them born, or do they go up against each other while they're still inside their mom? No, 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 no. They're separated. There's a, oh, there's okay. a left oviduct and a right oviduct. So, the, so the two of them are born, and then they go their separate ways. But you know, people have hypothesized that they they've now got an edge because they have uh, you know they've literally been predators before they were born. Yeah, I, I mean that that would make sense from a from a logical evolutionary standpoint. I mean, those, these guys they come out, they're ready to kill, they're ready to grow, they're ready, they've got an yeah. advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a, a local shark, and we've got them in Great South Bay here in New York. Uh, so, uh, Bill, let's talk about the human factor now. You know, um, thanks to the media and sensationalism and stuff like that, cannibalism is thought to just exist in primitive societies. But how extensive was cannibalism throughout the human world in civilized societies? That was the other real surprise that I had. You know, I, I mentioned the fact that it blew me away that cannibalism was so widespread in the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. It also blew me away how extensive cannibalism was in uh, in Europe for hundreds of years mm -hmm. through the Renaissance, right up until the beginning of the 20th century. There were, there were instances. 
Uh, and this was really surprising that so many body parts were consumed for so many medicinal reasons, mm. uh, especially when you look at the fact that, that, that cannibalism at the same time was, uh, was the ultimate Western taboo. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so th that, that, was, uh, that was something that was really shocking. Uh, and, and, and royalty and, and scientists and doctors and, and, and peasants, and uh, they all consumed human flesh for various reasons. Oh, okay. So other than medicinal and, of course, survival, what other reasons did people uh, consume uh, human body parts for? Well, ritual cannibalism is a is a broad heading, and that encompasses uh, things like uh, like burial uh, or, or funerary practices. Uh -huh. So instead of burying your dead, mm -hmm. if you weren't taught since the time of the Greeks that cannibalism was the worst thing that you could do to somebody, mm -hmm. um, if you didn't get that, you know, in a sense, culture is king. So it's what your culture dictates, and in many of these cultures. Um, these people learned from their elders and and through tradition that that consuming your was what you did with your loved ones or, or with someone that was slain in a, in a battle mm -hmm. um and so when western anthropologists and missionaries met these people uh, these indigenous folks were, were just as mortified at the idea uh, that that the westerners were burying their dead mm -hmm. as the western or that these people were consuming their dead so once again you know I, I wish I came up with the term, but culture is king. It's what you're taught. It's what, you know, we're taught because of a long history that dates back to the Greeks, goes through the Romans, goes mm -hmm. through Shakespeare, mm -hmm. the Brothers Grimm, right. um, on and on, this snowball effect of uh, how, how cannibalism is the worst thing that you can do. So right. we, we have this knee-jerk reaction to it, where other cultures just didn't have that exposure, and so it, it was perfectly normal for them. Mm, okay, okay. So, uh, so it's sort of like a cultural and I don't know, probably religious or spiritual aspect to it. Then, absolutely. Mm. So, in, in you know, in Christianity, we, we we've got you know consuming the host and the, and and the wine is, you know, back in the old days that, that there's you know there's sort of a nod nod wink wink approach to to communion. You know, do you really do most people really think that they're eating the flesh of Jesus Christ? Right, I, I right. would or not. Yeah. Um, but you know, but hundreds of years ago, that was just not the case. Mm -hmm. Everyone thought to believe that this is the actual body of Jesus Christ, and mm -hmm. if you, for example, um, tamper with uh, with the host, uh, then you are uh, then you're committing a crime, and, and thousands of people were put to death, tortured, and put to death for crimes, imaginary crimes like uh, you know, uh, uh, torturing the host, uh, mm -hmm. desecrating the host. Um, so yeah, it's it, to me these were the really these were the interesting things that that, that I learned when when I studied this. Wow, interesting, interesting. And speaking of the Romans, did they uh, consume uh, the blood of gl gladiators as well? I mean, mm -hmm. I think I saw some read something like that. I'm trying to remember now. I, I know that it was more widespread in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Oh, I'm not okay, sure if right. Galen and his pals were consuming gladiator blood, but I know that by the time you got to the Middle Ages, people were lining up at uh, at executions, uh, for example, to to gather blood from uh, from the the newly executed or still alive and and uh -huh. you know on the way uh, to cure epilepsy and 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 things like that. I'm not oh, sure okay. if the, I'm not sure that the Romans were doing that. Okay, all right. Okay, cool. I got that. Okay. So you mentioned in your book that Neanderthals, you know, they might have engaged in this, and this may be a reason why they went extinct. Why do you think uh, this was so? Yeah, I don't really think that that is the reason why the Neanderthals went extinct. There, but, there's, there, yeah, there's a researcher out there, um, Simon Underdown, who believes that, that diseases, a, a Kuru or a mad cow-like disease, yeah, yeah. which is and these diseases have been shown to be related to cannibalism, mm. that this might have added to the, um, um, you, know, you know, to the, how fast the, the Neanderthals went extinct. Ah. And that, that instead, instead of it being the reason, it was sort of a drip, drip, drip process right. where this just, this might have been a part of the tipping point that, that sent them over the edge because it was clear that, that the Neanderthals and other ancient humans, yeah. um, 
fed on um, on on the bodies of uh, of of the dead. Yeah, I mean, like uh, Kur itself, it was discovered among uh, cannibals in the South Pacific, right? Yeah, in New in New, in excuse me in New Guinea. In New Guinea, yeah, yes. In, yeah, researchers and government officials right after World War II discovered that these uh, the New Guinea Highlanders, the foray, were were consuming their dead as as part of funerary rituals, like I mm. described before. All right. Are there other adverse uh, biological effects, pathological effects to engaging cannibalism other than CJD, Kuru? That's the big one. I mean, um, you know, to me, that's that's the one that almost sent the, the foray into extinction. And, and it's really one of the problems that, that you'd have to consider if, if cannibalism became widespread for any reason in the future. Right. But um, as far as something that's another negative, um, there is a an evolutionary metric called um, inclusive fitness, which is a, in a sense a measure of, of how many genes there are in your population. Mm -hmm. So, so if you are eating your kin, you are in you are decreasing your inclusive fitness. Yes, so from yes. an, so from an evolutionary biologist standpoint, uh, it sort of doesn't make sense to eat um, organisms that are that are related to you. Yeah. Now I don't know how that plays out with humans. If you're eating, you're dead. Um, but I think it's used primarily in the animal kingdom as, a, as sort of the big negative. Whereas in, in mammals, and especially in humans, mm -hmm. it's uh, fungiform encephalopathies, these diseases that, are, that have been clearly shown to be related to, uh, to consuming, um, consuming your own kind, especially the nervous system. Yeah, yeah, right, got that. Okay, cool. So, Bill, let's say you met up with someone, you know, someone's curious about cannibalism, has imbibed all the social taboos about it. Despite that, still interested in figuring out what it's all about, although not likely from a practical perspective, unless it's purely for survival, in the real world. What would be that one thing you'd tell that person about cannibalism, what it is, and what it's all about? Oh yes. Well, there's a there's a that's a question that's that I might want to think about for a minute. Right. Um, it, it, it to me to me cannibalism is extremely widespread behavior, mm -hmm. and it's also natural behavior, mm -hmm. and uh, and that we need to get past our our perception that that cannibalism only occurs when there is a lack of food. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my you know that would be a take home message for me. Oh. Is just to uh, you need to open up to the fact that that this is a uh, behavior that is quite natural mm -hmm. and and occurs for a number of reasons that you might not suspect. Mm. All right, okay, got that. So that's a big take home right there. Definitely, it's different from all the sensationalist stuff that we're bound to hear from the media and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, try to stay away from that. You know, there there's just such a pile of it, and you know, even yeah, I've been interviewed about this book and it's clear if you read the book that I tried you know you've got to mention criminal cannibalism mm. but so much so much has been done on, on the sensational side yeah. that um that I just avoid it but then then I'll get interviewed by somebody and then they'll say yeah that's a really good interest that that's a great way to approach things and then the uh, article will come out and there'll be a picture of, suitable for framing of Jeffrey Dahmer in it so mm -hmm. you know we're to this sensational aspect of it, I think sometimes uh, you know without w without even knowing it. Right, and of course it doesn't help that you know there are guys like Dr. Hannibal Lecter out there, you know, uh, fictional characters that do engage in the sensational aspect of cannibalism. Absolutely. Right. Cool. Okay, so Bill, uh, we, we we spoke a little bit about this earlier, but ha have you also written fiction in addition to your uh, your scholarly books? I mean, well, not really scholarly, but nonfiction books. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been really lucky in that regard. I just had uh, my first novel came out in June of this year, mm. uh, and oh, excuse me, June of, of 2016, um, and it's uh, it is a, a World War II thriller that okay. takes place in the wilds of um, of of South America, right, and uh, and there's there's a lot of zoology in it, and there's a lot of my love of history in that book as well. Nice. And um, you know, the sequel will be out. The sequel is, is called the Himalayan Codex. Mm -hmm. That will be uh, out in June of 2017. Oh, okay, so one year apart. Yeah, Hell's Gate last June, uh, and uh, and the Himalayan Codex this coming June. All right, cool. So uh, yeah, 
uh, th th those certainly sound interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I have a lot of fun with it. I, you know, I'm, I'm a history lover, so I'm able. To, I was able to sort of bring in people from the 1940s that I loved and make them characters, like the artist Charles R. Knight at the Museum of Natural History, and right. and the late ones got, uh, uh, you know, has uh, um, Bernard Herrmann, the great com composer, and Alfred Hitchcock, and. Mm. Uh, a lot of neat folks that uh, that I've always admired, and now I'm able to, in a sense, bring them to life. All right, great, fantastic. So, uh, multi uh, multi talented. You don't only write nonfiction; you also write fiction as well. <laughs> Very lucky. I don't know how talented. Uh, okay, I got that. Okay. So, Bill, in the last few minutes of this interview, are there any last words of wisdom uh, you'd like to share, to inspire, or inform our listeners about anything at all? No, I Great question. I, I just think that people should keep their eyes open and, mm. and not uh, and, and not swallow the sensationalized or uh, you know uh, the that angle all the time because often there's uh, there are explanations that are even more interesting. Um, you know the, the the polar bear cannibalism is one that really comes to mind, mm. where you see all of these uh, spectacular uh, shots of polar bears dragging their cubs around, and then you see these headlines about. Uh, global warming is causing polar bears to become cannibals, and, right. and that's the case. Uh, polar bears have been consuming their cubs for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so uh, I'm not saying that there's not an effect of, of, of climate change, but that's really not the whole story here. Right? Right. You know, the story is, is more interesting than that. It has to do with the fact that you know, polar bears, male polar bears are now having to venture into places where uh, where they didn't encounter females and their cubs before, and that mm -hmm. may very well have to do with uh, with less ice. Mm -hmm. But but the knee jerk reaction is is one that is uh, you know uh, is problematic, right? You know, especially when people point out the fact that hey, guess what? What's this about ca about polar bears being cannibals? And and scientists knew about it, and and so yeah, of course we did, but but the. It was it was actually the media who took this and twisted it around to sound like there was this uh, that that there was this direct effect when in reality it's much more complex than that. Mm, okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, so thoughts thoughts to consider right there, listeners. So in closing, then the book is Cannibalism: a Perfectly Natural History. The authors are guest Bill Shutt, and you can find his book at his website BillShutt.com are also on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and the websites of any other major, uh, major, major bookstores. So, Bill, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for being an author story. It was pretty insightful having you with us today. Well, thanks for having me on your show, Alex. Uh, I, um, I, it was a pleasure. Cool. So, if any of you listeners want to know more about what I'm what we've covered to be a bit of a taboo topic, uh, but which really shouldn't be as far as Natural Kingdom is concerned. Uh, you can get the book right now by going to the Amazon link in the description below the video. And if you'd like to follow our author interviews on YouTube, I invite you to subscribe to our channel. So bye for now everyone. I'll be back on Author Story with another inspiring author.